Welcome to Mind Your Health. David Burke and I are excited to be here and we have a fantastic guest today. I guess I should introduce him. Absolutely. Okay. You, you know him way better than I Exactly. <laughs> Not that we do shameless self-promotion or anything like that, but this is my son, Dr. Brandon Runyon, and he is a radiologist. And again, we try really hard to present educational information that people can take away, use, it's practical, it's evidence-based, and create an understanding that maybe people don't know about. So we have you captive, mm -hmm. and I'm super excited to chat with you, and there are so many things we could talk about. And he actually does get words in edgewise, so. Yeah, I, yeah it's popping in the middle sometimes, but I'm good. <laughs> no, but now you're good. But I think what we really want to talk about, Brandon, today is broad spectrum. Do you agree? I and do. I think that is really talking about radiology in general, okay? okay? First about what a radiologist does, and then some of the new practices within the field of radiology. Okay, so broadly what a radiologist does is, um, really two components. One is we look at and interpret medical imaging. Uh, so that is looking at MRIs, mammograms, ultrasounds, CT scans, x-rays, and we try to consolidate a lot of information into clin clinically meaningful words for other doctors and patients to use. So what I hear you say is the doctors <clears throat> prescribe the imaging, you sort of diagnose what is going on uh, frequently, we try to consolidate the information from the images into a tool that is clinically useful for the doctors to use so that they can put that in together with other clinical information to try to determine what could be causing the patient's problem. Oh, kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the, real briefly, the evolution because the technology today is so <laughs> much better than it was, you know. I remember developing the old x-rays <laughs> right, yeah. to now <laughs> so true. Uh, portable ultrasounds and you know, all the things that are available. Sure. How, how yeah, you, life, uh, how even, in, even in my career, which is about 15 years old, like I've seen a lot of changes even in, in my short span. So um, the biggest changes in the last 10 years have all been relating to computing, and that is only getting accelerated. Okay. So, what does uh, that mean? Well, so computer tools play a big role in radiology. Uh, through several facets, um, the most important being that it helps to take the large amount of data that we get from the machines and put that into clinically, clinically useful images that then I can kind of look at and interpret. So we have tools that aid in interpretation or uh, tools that aid in our ability to dictate. Uh, with AI, we have also tools Whoa. that enhance our ability to detect, tools that uh, will enhance our ability to take even bad information or less information or data from a machine and turn that into better, higher quality images. Mm. So for all of us sitting out here going, okay, I heard what you said, I understand the words, can you give me a practical example of what that would look like? So for MRI that we do at Bluffton Medical Center, okay, uh, we have a new AI tool that helps decrease the amount of time that it takes to acquire very high resolution MR images. Okay. So we can actually do see more patients in less time. Okay. The images that we get off of that are much higher quality and okay. have much higher diagnostic yield for people. So for example, if I go in for a breast exam, mm -hmm. we start with that. Let's just use that as, as an example. Explain the process and what you would be you would be doing from what you just said. In other words, you get the examination. So for a breast MRI, for instance? Yes. Okay, so for a breast MRI, uh, a woman would go up to go to the facility, they would have an IV started, uh, they would be placed in a breast coil. A okay. breast coil is where they're laying down and going into the MRI machine with the breast in, within the breast coil. Okay. A coil is a specialized listening device. Oh. So the way that MRI works is that the magnet creates a resonance within tissue. Mm. The tissue, the mm. signal that it emits is dependent on what's inside that tissue. And then we have a special listening device and that's what the coil does. Okay. What the computer does is it takes that information that the, the resonance or the radio signals that come out of the breast and it turns that into a picture. So it can, by using AI tools, it can take even very quiet signals and make a very 
clean image. So for breast MRI, how it would impact that directly is it can decrease the amount of time that the breast MRI takes about by about 20%. Oh, wow. So if normally it takes about 45 minutes to have a breast MRI, instead it would take about 30 minutes to have mm -hmm. a, a, okay. a breast MRI. So let's back up a little bit. How mm -hmm. often should a woman have a breast exam? So let's what? start with self. <clears throat> I know they do self exams. Sure. Well, regularly? Yeah, regular, I mean, breast exam, self breast exam, they're, the guidelines are actually more ambiguous because uh, there's mixed benefit to doing self breast exam. I think that most people would advocate for a regular self breast exam even on a monthly basis. Okay. And certainly, in my experience, I feel like women do have a pretty good handle on what's going on in their body and that if there's ever anything that were to trigger a concern, then it's worth having that evaluated. Mm -hmm. So thinking uh, about... Then how often, then go to the doctor, how often? Uh, OBGYN? OBGYN should be seen yearly okay. or uh, you know sometimes a health doctor should be seen yearly. And then what's the difference when when would you have a breast MRI because that just seems like you know farther down the road is that is if they find something do right. they have an MRI? So, well the, this question is more complicated because I think that there's a question of screening. It's more complicated. So, right? yeah. Welcome to my world. Right. Yeah. Welcome to our world. So there's a question of screening. So m most of the breast evaluation that women are familiar with is related to screening. And okay. screening is by definition people do, that don't have any symptoms. Right. I'm just going in. I'm to going in uh, to, to have my annual mammogram. Okay. And for then, for, for women over the age of 40, Although it, it is, there are various recommendations, and I do recommend women discussing it with their doctors. I think that annual screening mammography has a broad base of support for women over the age of 40. When it comes to MRI, MRI is a separate tool and a complementary tool to mammography. It does not replace mammograms. It is a supplemental tool. We just had that discussion with a girl that I called with mm -hmm. you, and she was like, can I just go straight to an MR instead of having that? And you were like, no, thank you. Right. Well, so, and that's a separate <laughs> issue. So then there's right. diagnostic mammograms. So if you have something that you feel in your breast, then you have, the, the, the step is to get a mammogram and an ultrasound. Okay. So if you have something palpable in your breast, there's really no way around it. There's kind of a, kind of a set pathway. So I feel it. One of the comfortable things about breast imaging for me is that it's a very set pathway. Okay. You come in with a problem. There's a, you get the mammogram. You step to the ultrasound, and then there's a decision that gets made, and that decision is based on those two findings alone. Okay. MRI is really a tool in the diagnostic setting for other specific unanswered questions. So if there's nipple discharge and you don't have an abnormality, for instance, a bloody okay. nipple discharge, then it might be the best next step to see to, to get an MRI. But typically that's a decision made by a breast surgeon. Uh, locally, Dr. Ringer is mm -hmm. our breast surgeon that we work very closely with and we collaborate in terms of determining best next steps for patients. And that's for diagnostic breast Okay, MRI. that's not screening. There's that's screening. not screening. We still screening have a screening, there. right. So for screening, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if for people that have high risk, okay. which can be related to family history, can be related to certain genetic markers that okay. are getting tested for, for instance, BRCA, which is okay. one that a lot of people know about, uh, that really can help triage people towards getting a screening breast MRI. Okay, got and it. And for, for women that are at high risk, it's really annual screening breast MRI. Uh, is and recommended. it's helpful. And it's helpful. And it is a, a complementary tool, not a replacement for, uh, for mammogram. Can I ask about men and breast cancer? Because recently, I never even thought about men and breast cancer, but recently I've heard two people, two men who have had um, breast issues. Mm -hmm. So breast cancer in men is far less common than for women. You know, for women, it's about one in eight women have uh, uh -huh. get breast cancer. Uh, for men, it's far less than that. It's more like one in a hundred. Okay. Uh, but it still accounts for about five percent of breast cancers per year for men in the United States. To um, so it's still a, a significant number. When mm -hmm. I hear us talk about breast cancer, I think for all women, we our heart kind of races a little bit, right? We get a little scared, if you will, or apprehensive. But since you and I have talked about it a lot. You basically f ha are very positive about the, diagno the diagnosing and then the treatment. Yeah, I think for the majority of cancers that we detect at screening, the majority of women do well. And uh, you know, that said, <clears throat> there, you know, cancer is a diverse illness. Uh, so although most of the types of breast cancer that we are able to diagnose can be treated with 
relatively minor surgery mm -hmm. and short courses of radiation therapy and hormone mod modulation drugs such as tamoxifen. There are some cancers that are bad actors Got it. Um, that are scarier. So when we talk about that, you know, about one in eight women mm -hmm. will develop breast cancer. And they're like the majority of those cancers are actually relatively easy to treat and even easy to cure mm -hmm. with a subset of those cancers that can be very bad actors that are much more challenging to treat. I yeah. think next time Brandon comes on, we should talk about prostate cancer because that's only fair. Yeah, Janae Reed, I think if, if men live long enough, it's 100% that you will yeah. get prostate cancer and, and at some time in your life. And part of the if job. You, you don't die from something else. That, <laughs> and, that, that's, and the tools for prostate cancer, I think, are really interesting now, too. Those have evolved quite a bit. So, uh, prostate MRI. Mm -hmm. uh, which again is not a general tr screening tool, so not everybody would get a prostate MRI, but PSA is a screening tool. It's a uh, prostate-specific antigen. That's a blood test that people get commonly. Oh, there you go. So for people that have, have an elevated PSA, uh, we can triage that to get a prostate MRI. And okay. then prostate MRI is actually, I think, really interesting because we're not just looking for the presence or the possibility of prostate cancer, but we're looking for a clinically significant cancer. Um, so to that point, the, uh, if you have prostate nodules, you might have a low probability of having that prostate cancer spread. But with MRI, we're actually able to differentiate better if a cancer has a higher risk of spread mm -hmm. and to help triage people towards uh, prostate treatment. Is there an age that men should have a prostate screening? For a PSA, uh, I, I which mean, is the blood test, which is the blood test. I think that the similar for women, you know, you want to see your doctor, have your annual screening, and mm -hmm. then they have a battery of tests that are recommended for men. And those those recommendations can change and vary based on the individual. So I just think it's really important to discuss it with the doc with your doctor. So if we're doing takeaway. Our takeaways today are get your screenings, whether you're a man. Well, I would start with see your doctor. Okay. <laughs> start with see your doctor. I would also uh, second that your screening really should be personalized. So ah. we can talk about standard recommendations for things, but I think it is important to uh, for women to take into account specific factors such as breast density and genetic factors. Uh, for men, similar with the genetic factors, uh, but there are also other considerations to take care of for men's health and men's screening. Uh, and then, but then in general, like in have, general. <laughs> having a colonoscopy, you know, first colonoscopy at the age of 45 uh, for all people, uh, for women starting annual screening mammography uh, on an annual basis beginning at age 40 is very important for men. Keeping an eye on things like PSA are great first steps for, for, for screening. So these tips are excellent and help us to mind your health. <laughs> mind your health, mind your health, mind your health, mind your health.